Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents Man at the Gate. Here you will learn how to apply your Christian ethics in the political arena. This includes our local and federal politics. Come, sit, relax, and enjoy our time together as we discuss the state of our nation and what it looks like to be salt and light in a pagan world. Hi, welcome to another episode of Man at the Gate. I am your host, Carrie Appling, and today's episode is Episode 6, Covenantal Vomit. Um, I have been in the works on this episode for quite some time. Um, I have also had a series of more unfortunate events in my life that have just uh, required most of my attention. Um, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. It hasn't slowed me down as far as making podcasts or anything like that uh, for the long term. Um, so I'm hoping to uh, have more consistent shows coming out uh, uh, at a, in a faster pace. Um, covenantal vomit is today's uh, lesson. And I'm going to jump right into it because we have a lot to go through. So let's get started. We're going to start in Acts uh, chapter 16 verses 25 through 40. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to you, have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No! Let them come out, or let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, They encouraged them and departed. And I also want to read from Acts 22, verses 22 through 29. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. And the tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum of money. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. And then I have two more uh, verses. Real quick, it is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 12 through 16, I promise uh, everything will make sense here in a minute. I just want to make sure we get into God's word before I start uh, building upon the foundation. 
So 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And now 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Guys, I have been yearning to make another podcast um, so that we can begin the work of reconstruction. But before we can begin that work, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about deconstructing and reconstructing our world from a spiritual standpoint. So here's what Rush Dooney says in his Systematic Theology in page 358 towards the top. He is going to give us a commentary on 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16, the discerning man. The meaning then is this, away with all the discernment of the flesh as to this matter. It is the spiritual man alone that has such a firm and solid acquaintance with the mysteries of God as to distinguish without fail between truth and falsehood, between the doctrine of God and the contrivances of men, so as not to fall into mistake. He, on the other hand, is judged by no man because the assurance of faith is not subject to men, as though they could make it totter at their nod, it being superior even to angels themselves. Observe that this prerogative is not ascribed to the man as an individual, but to the word of God, which the spiritual flow follow in judging, and which is truly dictated to them by God with true discernment. Where that is afforded, a man's persuasion is placed beyond the range of human judgment. Observe farther. The word rendered judged, by which the apostle intimates that we are not merely enlightened by the Lord to perceive the truth, but we are also endowed with a spirit of discrimination so as not to hang in doubt between truth and falsehood, but are able to determine what we ought to shun and what to follow. Here's what Rush Dooney says. Calvin's emphasis is not on the individual's power of judgment but on the necessity of judgment in the Spirit and in faithfulness to the Word of God. The prerogative in judgment belongs to God. Hence, the spiritual man is the man who is faithful to the whole Word of God in and by the Spirit of God. Too often man can tell, hang on here, too often man can tell that something is wrong and even rightly address the nuance of the issue when it comes to giving an actual concrete answer as to how to fix the issue, he is more likely to give a solution that does just as much damage, if not more than the original problem has created. Or the solution in their mind is, quote, not Hillary, which is a non-answer. That's that's not an answer in the least. It's a reactionary worldview. Another aspect is that he only deals with the superficial aspects of the problem. The problem that is only immediately seen to be the problem when there is so much more to be exposed that led to it. Discernment has been so demoralized in our nation and around the world that to even see anything wrong in the world is to be labeled a Marxist or a liberal because only bleeding-hearted liberals and snowflakes have compassion and notice anything wrong. To even point out injustice these days is to be labeled as a person with a victimhood mentality or syndrome. Unless it's abortion, homosexuality, or transgenderism, if you pick up the banner of any of those three topics, you are sure to have a group of edgelords running into battle with you to bathe in the tears of their tribal enemies. The edgelords thirst to be hated for their bitterness and ungracious attacking of their politically tribal enemies. These are the people who love Kavanaugh being confirmed to the Supreme Court not because he stands for righteousness and could help correct the radically out-of-control SCOTUS 
Instead, the Edge Lords only love that Kavanaugh has been confirmed because it pissed off their mortal enemies. These people, in a very real way, seek first the demise and utter destruction of their enemies and believe righteousness will be accounted to them in doing so. They offer no answers, though. None. The answer is merely to drive the wedge between them and feminazis as deep as possible. These people don't love Christ or even have biblically ethical answers. Their only lot in life is to find the not Hillary candidates and vote for them, then wear truck driver-esque baseball caps that show just how little they invest in their politics while showcasing as much bravado they can in the process. Edge lords are the peacocks of American politics. Engaging such a one in political discourse would be like having a discussion with an NPC or a non-player character you see in a video game. They have pre-programmed responses, have no ambition or personal principles or ethics. Their only principle is to piss off a liberal. Today, if, it, if I find it funny that they label feminazis as NPCs when they are as brainwashed to their own presuppositions as the liberals are. And so a non-player character, for anyone who doesn't play video games or is not familiar with uh, that kind of reference in pop culture, it just basically means that there's a software or a, um, uh, a person in the game that's not really a person. They're, they're programmed by the programmers to have certain uh, responses when you click on them or when you ask them a question. And so the, those pre-programmed responses are, are what is sort of becoming popular in uh, memes today with NPCs. Um, and basically, it's no different uh, the conservative edgelords on the right and the feminazi uh, liberals on the left. Uh, they're no different. They both have pre-programmed responses, and so they're constantly engaging each other and regurgitating pre-programmed responses. And this is why you know when you're talking to a neoconservative edgelord or when you're talking to a extreme liberal feminazi, before you even ask them the question, uh, you know, you can pick any number of questions. In many cases, you already know the answer that they're going to say. And that's because you are aware of some of these pre-programmed responses that people only regurgitate uh, in order to keep the power structure for themselves. So here's what 2 Timothy 3 says. So keep this in mind that the spiritual man is to discern and the the people of the flesh who are not Christians, who are not born again, are unable to discern. And so 2 Timothy 3, chapter 3, I'm just going to read the whole chapter because it's not very long. So this no also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres, I think that's how you say it, so forgive me, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, and what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. 
and that from a child that thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And now I'm going to go to to Leviticus 18 through 24. Leviticus 18, 24 through 30. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things. For by all these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled. Therefore I mu- I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all these abominations the men of the land have done, who were before you, and thus the land is defiled. Lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. For whoever commits any of these abominations, the persons who commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore you shall keep my ordinance, so that you do not commit any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that you do not defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord your God. I want you to stop and think about what God is saying in Leviticus 18 here. He is tying obedience to the land. He is tying tying the defilement of, of a individual person and the defilement of an entire nation having seeped into the land itself. And that the only way to fix it is to vomit them out. The land, he says, lest the land vomit you out when you also defile it, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. So I want us to keep this in mind as we continue to talk about reconstruction and deconstruction and, and this covenantal vomit idea, that when either, either people are in obedience or disobedience to Christ. Either a nation is in the process of being sanctified according to the word of God and faith in Christ, or it is in rebellion and it is in the process of being destroyed and vomited out of the land because the the sins of the people actually tied to the land promises that God has given in the Old Testament and in the New because the meek shall inherit the earth. And that is a continuation of the promise from the Old Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Israelites were the ones inheriting the new land. In the New Testament, God's people are the ones inheriting the new land, the true Israelites, as Paul would say. So keep this in mind um, as we talk about how we're going to develop a, a judicial ethic. If you don't want to participate in developing a judicial biblical ethic, you will simply be vomited out. It's pretty pretty basic stuff uh, from what I'm learning on uh, from the covenantal reconstructionist um, viewpoint of the Bible, which I believe is the correct interpretation. And here's some more from um, Rush Tooney's systematic theology. Every man's life is governed by an implicit systematic theology, by certain presuppositions which form a coherent whole and govern his thoughts in life. I have over the years worked and talked with a great variety of peoples of differing races, African American, African or American Indians, Negroes, Europeans, Asianatics, Latin Americans, North Americans, and others. It is the great myth of the modern intellectual that only he is capable of intelligent, logical thinking. Implicit in his arrogant faith is the assumption that wisdom began with him and his kind. Apart from the intellectual, it is held, and before him, men were and are primitives, and their thinking is mythical and prelogical. One can counter by pointing out that no greater myths have ever been created by the mind of man than those of modern man. Some of these myths are evolution, the natural goodness of man, or at worst, his neutral state, 
and the myths of origins and of history this faith leads to. Modern anthropology and its myths concerning man's nature and society, the myth of salvation through politics and education, and much, much more. The intellectuals, to the contrary, men, are everywhere logical and systematic in their thinking. The problem lies not in their thinking, but in their presuppositions. So why do Christians not think like Paul in these areas of life? The temptation is to become pragmatists and co-opt the new tyrannical practice and power structure and say, quote, it's impossible to beat, so we need to work within the system. Purely reactionary. Purely reactionary. No deconstruction and reconstruction are in these people's minds. They have no idea of what they, what God demands from them in their Christian life as it pertains to exposing darkness, insulting uh, the world. Instead, anyone who attempts to deconstruct a societal problem and offer both the deconstruction and reconstruction of how you fix the problem is merely labeled a utopian who has pie-in-the-sky ideas that will never come to fruition. This isn't utopian thinking. It's the application of faith to deconstruct an issue apart from modern conservative or liberal humanistic frameworks and develop a judicial, ethical application for today. This is needed every minute of every day until Christ returns and puts the capstone on what has been fully reconstructed. Which is to say, Adam's reign is to be deconstructed and Christ's reign is to be reconstructed according to the obedience of faith in Christ. I hope you got that. I want to read that again. This is needed every minute of every day until Christ returns and puts the capstone on what has been fully reconstructed. Which is to say... Adam's reign is to be deconstructed and Christ's reign is to be reconstructed according to the obedience of faith in Christ. So, Carrie, what are you talking about? What is deconstruction and what is reconstruction if I have new listeners or even listeners who are still growing in this idea of theonomy? The idea of deconstruction is very simple. It's the idea of seeing a problem in the world, finding the source of its problem, and and Coming up with a way, so that's the first one. Deconstruction is like seeing the issue and trying to come up with a way to understand how it came about. Reconstruction is takes over from that process and says, okay, now we move into how do we build after we have done away with the problem. So deconstruction isn't merely theoretical. It's not just, you know, think about what caused the problem. You have to get rid of that. You have to get rid of the system and deconstruct it, not just theoretically, but in actual life. So this is different from anything else you'll hear from most Christians in modern America because everything's spiritual to them. So they, they're not in the business of deconstructing and looking at issues and seeing how they got there and how do we get through them for the most part. None of them are interested in that. They're interested in keeping the, the system as it is and pragmatically wielding it uh, like Boromir would argue to wield the ring. Instead of deconstructing, Boromir would rather assume power in the structure and wield it uh, for whatever purposes he desired. So then after you've deconstructed the issue, you have to reconstruct perfectly. So deconstruction, think of deconstruction uh, from the standpoint of foundation. Christ says that you have either sand or you have rock, solid rock. So if you're on the sand, the house breaks and is destroyed. If you're on the rock, winds come, nothing happens. People, things that need to be deconstructed are things that are on sand, things that are in disobedience to Christ. And these can be these can range from uh, from issues of race, issues of as we've talked about here, uh, the drug uh, uh, drug war, uh, foreign policy, fiat currency, um, philosophy, psychology. Keep going, never ends. Everything, all areas of life, gardening, work ethic, uh, you know, driving your vehicle, uh, you know, rules on the road, things like that. All of that needs to be discussed and literally applied by Christians and none of this is being done. Liberals disobey the feds over immigration and marijuana. 
They did the same for same-sex marriage long before it was considered federally legal, and yet conservatives demand that they will not be lawless like their liberal friends. Which isn't lawlessness, but instead constitutionality, rightly applied, as well as the doctrine of lesser magistrate. It's extremely sad that liberals practice the doctrine of the lesser magistrate for oftentimes wickedness and even righteousness, specifically in the case of legalization of marijuana, while conservatives still demand the tyrannical power structure stay in place while they, out of the corner of their mouth, daydream about secession. And they don't even have the testicular fortitude to stand up for the most innocent that are being slaughtered among us at 3,000 children a day. And that's the unborn. Abortion is the judgment of God on America. And the refusal to do anything about it is the judgment of God on the church. So where are the pastors as it pertains to this teaching? Their silence is damning. And I'm not just talking about abortion. I'm talking about this entire idea and this entire concept of the Christian obedient life, the one of deconstruction and reconstruction. Their silence from the pews leaves in turn or their silence in turn leaves their congregate her, their congregants uninformed about issues from a biblically ethical position and therefore they are left to find answers in the pagan world of humanistic pragmatic thought instead of faith applied through God's law Christians in America are so lacking in discernment that they not only cannot rightly deconstruct the world they live in but they have no hope in offering a fully consistent and ethical worldview. This is why reactionary populism has completely dominated the Western world of politics. Instead of Kavanaugh's judicial record, we only discuss what makes him popular or unpopular in the eyes of the people. And I believe King Saul and the people of Israel come to mind personally. There are ethical ways of deconstructing and there are unethical ways of deconstructing. So we would argue that uh, the liberals are deconstructing in a radically satanic form uh, in, in almost all cases. But gender in specific is one we can point out. That they have decided to deconstruct the Western worldview that was constructed, in, that was reconstructed by Christians, which is the, the Western worldview is a Christian worldview, they want to deconstruct that, and, and they are slowly doing that, while the Christians aren't even interested in deconstructing anything. In fact, what, what they want to do is, like I said, keep the, keep the same system and then use it for their own purposes against their enemies. Most conservative and liberal states are more interested in creating greater local tyrannies rather than preventing the already astronomical federal tyrannies that already exist. If the feds don't shake us down, the state and local magistrates aren't far behind to grab what has, wasn't stolen by the feds. The conservatives who claim to hate the national welfare state demand local schools, roads, bonds, and other local regulations be levied in order to, quote, maintain order. And this is just local socialism. Instead of having a federal socialism, these conservatives think that it's much more honorable to have local socialism so that they can keep it under, quote-unquote, wraps, basically. That they believe that a little socialism is good. And any, I don't know of hardly any pastor I've ever talked to personally that has said, uh, all socialism is bad. Because when it comes to, I once had a pastor who said he believed in uh, the mandate to pay taxes to pay for the public school system because it is an issue of national defense. If the people are stupid, they can be easily manipulated by foreign, uh, foreign um, interests. So in order to make sure that the people are safe and in, in, uh, intellectually defended, it is our prerogative to make sure that everyone pays for taxation or, or pays through their taxes. It's not the best system, but it's what we have, you know. And so just know that if you continue in your pragmatism, then not only is God's creation groaning to be redeemed from pagans, but it is also groaning to be redeemed from pragmatic Christians who are faithless 
and compound the issues of our culture by believing that God operates according to the popular majority as opposed to the remnant. The belief in horses and chariots. The belief that in order to save myself from Babylonian captivity, I must ally, I must ally my, uh, I must ally, ally with Egyptians and pagan governments. Judgment begins in the house of God. Most Christians think victory is seizing the power structure and using it against their political enemies, which is purely pagan, and is a real threat to even our eternal destination. These issues are just. Fun theoretic, aren't just fun theoretical talks. If you believe in this corrupt system, your very soul is at stake. And Christ came to free you from that bondage. He can free you from the, e from the fear of men and the pragmatic reactionary life that leaves you empty and corrupted. God is not pleased in the least, and he won't be mocked. I'm going to read Revelation 3 through 17. All right, Revelation 3, 15 through 17. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have no need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And this describes American Christians to a T. I can't continue to tackle major problems until my audience understands what we're doing here. And what we're doing at Man at the Gate is we're deconstructing and reconstructing. We're going to take a concept, and this is what I'm trying to have you apply. I want you to apply this system of thought into your life, Christian, as the biblical mode of discernment. This is how you discern the world. You discern it according to faith. You don't discern it according to what could work. You're either Boromir or you're Frodo or you're Bilbo. You're either the pragmatist who wants nothing changed, ultimately. The only thing they want changed is who has the gun in their hand. And so every two years, 51% will either maintain control of the firearm or lose it to their political enemies. And every two years, it's a messianic complex for a reason. People literally believe that unless they have the power structure, they will be destroyed. And I don't believe them. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't blame them because we know that that's true. We know that in many cases, when evil Babylonians seize power structures, they don't relinquish them and they use them against their enemies. But I think the real fear is that people realize what, the, what they do when they're in power. The conservatives realize how much tyranny they impose when they're in power. And they are okay with that tyranny being imposed on other people. And even in some cases themselves... But they don't want to lose that power because they know what the alternative is. Now, instead of them in uh, benefiting from the structure, now it's going to be turned against them. And this happens every two to four years in America. And it's completely destructive to, to, to like just basic peace in, in a society. There's no peace in America because there's no judicial ethical system that that prevents us being turned against each other constantly in a power structure to gain um, to, uh, to gain power. So as we move forward, you can go back and listen to some of my episodes, the drug war and uh, uh, the other things I've, I've covered. And you can, you can see where I am deconstructing much of what we're talking about in our culture and in many cases failing to reconstruct properly. And so think of today's episode as a deconstructing of and a, de a deconstruction a reconstruction of how you think about deconstruction and reconstruction. Because most Christians aren't in even interested in this idea. While pagans and liberals, they understand deconstruction. They understand the the imperative necessary pressure 
applied to them to do this. Because you're made in the image of God, first and foremost, like Rushton, he said, there is no systematic theology that no one applies to their life. Whether they're the, uh, the isolated tribe that kills the Christian who shows up uh, to evangelize the Lord, or you're just a neoconservative sitting in the pews here in America. Both the tribe and the humanists sitting in the pews both have complete uh, worldviews. And they also believe that there are things that are wrong either in the world or in their worldviews that need to be deconstructed, destroyed, and then properly built back up. And that is not something you can escape. Even when we look at art, we deconstruct it. Why is that there? What does this symbol mean? I wonder why the director chose to emphasize this. Oh, look at the cinematography here. That's an interesting... What we're doing is we're deconstructing constantly. This is the life of the discerning Christian is one of deconstruction. And many times, and I'm, I'm just as guilty, of deconstructing without properly reconstructing. Now, I can't offer all the answers here, and I've told you I'm not going to offer all the answers. But what we can do is we can properly deconstruct some things, and then in the process of reconstruction, because I can't write an entire um, you know, creed, and I can't tackle every single thing in the world. No one can. Not, no one man can, and we shouldn't. I'm not going to. I don't have the power right now. I don't, I don't have any of that power. But what I am saying is that if we deconstruct it properly and we start with a foundation where we sort of say, hey, here's where, how we want to start the reconstruction. Here's the solid foundation. Let's make sure we lay that solid foundation. And that can be either really quick work or really slow work. But what we want to do is build on that. And that's what Paul says. Paul says that he wants to build upon what other people have already established. And basically, we live in a culture now where Christian be Christians believe that we are done with this process. That the only thing that matters is saying you believe in Jesus and obeying the Ten Commandments. And that's it. That's it. But there's no struggle. There's no desire to change the world, to proclaim Christ, to establish justice, to plead the cause of the widow and the orphan that... There are poor people being grinded by into the ground. Their faces being smashed into the ground. Not overtly. Not some guy just walking up and stop and and you know stomping their head into the ground. And 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 that is very much also the case in America. But God knows that their faces are being ground in you know into the ground because of the intricate structures that sinners create in order to do that. So that. What, not one person is held responsible because in a, bureaucrat, in a bureaucratic hellscape that we live in in America, there's not, there's not just one person who's held accountable because the police officer's just doing his job, because the judge is just doing his job, because the lawyer is just doing his job, because the jailer is just doing his job, because the warden is just doing his job. And all that simply means is the grass is greener over here. The grass is greener on the other side of the cage. And as long as I'm not in the cage, it's not a big deal. You know, you can look up statistics on how many jailers end up in prison. And the thing is, when you, when you see the intricacies that man creates by falsely reconstructing, because that's what, it, that's what that is. That's false reconstruction. That is... Sinners reconstructing a system to oppress certain people at the benefit of others. And that is iniqui iniquitous. And that is what will cause God to vomit us out. When there's no effort made whatsoever to proclaim justice, to deconstruct every single area, that even when that even when liberals do get some things wrong in deconstructing certain things, it is not my prerogative to win a, popular, a popularity contest and saying, if a liberal talks about it, you got to know it's demonic. If a liberal says that we're breathing air, you know he's lying and we're breathing steel. 
And that's just pure contrarian, uh, contrarianistic ideas. That's just pragmatism. That's just looking at someone else and dehumanizing any thought that could ever come out of their mouths instead of taking the real, instead of doing the real work. The real work is saying, I see you deconstructing. Let me look at how you're deconstructing and see where you get it wrong and where you get it right or if you get it entirely right or entirely wrong. But what it comes down to is that both conservatives and liberals benefit from not deconstructing, from constantly, pragmatically building on the sand, because that's what we're doing now. There's no deconstructing. It's just the next two, you know, this next year, this is what we're going to try to get past in the year after that. But nothing that is past that is sinful or evil is almost ever reformed or brought back or even abolished. And it's not because it can't be done. It's because Christians refuse to do any work. Because y'all are just lazy. And that's hard to say. But I have hope. Because Christ is king. Because Christ says the meek shall inherit the earth. Because Christ is the one who has given us the great commission to move forward with the teachings of Christ for the obedience of the nations. That's what Paul says. That Christ's gospel is for the obedience of the nations, not their condemnation. Dispensationalists would have us believe that everything's going to eventually be burned and condemned. That's not what Paul's doctrine is. Paul's doctrine says that their folly is known to all of the world and that their deception will only get worse and that they cannot even spiritually discern the world around them. And we treat these people like like they're like they're Goliath. They're not even Goliath. They're they're not even Goliath. They're 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 nothings. They have no power. And and what's very sad is Christians have no power either in this culture because they have they don't use spiritual discernment. And when you refuse to have spiritual power by exercising discernment, you are powerless. And you're faithless. That's why, why I say that this is an eternal issue. That people who are pragmatic and apply no deconstructed or reconstructed ethics into the worldview that are biblical because you can't even escape deconstructing and reconstructing, but that you deconstruct and reconstruct in a biblical manner and that you have a command from Christ to do so, that this is not negotiable, that some people should deconstruct and some people should reconstruct her. You know, uh, that's just, that's your walk in life. That's what the Lord has called you to do. No, no, Mm-mm. especially if you have children. See, even with raising children, we, dem- we, almost, we, not almost, we assume our children know the social cues. We assume that the girls know how they should sit. We assume that, uh, you know, um, that they know how to act this way in a certain context. We assume all of those things, but we don't deconstruct it for them. We don't sit them down. Even our parenting is reactionary. Even whenever we go into a social situation and we haven't told our children how we expect them to act, and they don't and they don't obey our unsaid commands then we discipline them and that's and not and we then we don't even explain to them why we did it it's pure reactionism and then children become confused and and in many cases violent because they assume that we aren't willing to love them enough to help them understand the world that they're in and that's why I believe like children, the, the, our children are the gagging mechanism for covenantal vomit. Our children are going to be the fruit of either our faithfulness or our faithlessness. They are either going to continue to deconstruct and, unbib- deconstruct and reconstruct in unbiblical methods, or they're going to shine the fruit of their parents and begin to deconstruct and reconstruct in biblical methods. And this is why in my podcast about incarceration, I made it very clear that mass incarceration is slavery reconstructed in a different way. 
and that it wasn't properly ever deconstructed. Slavery was never properly deconstructed. Go and read the 13th Amendment. I've said it over and over again. It was never properly deconstructed, and therefore it cannot be properly reconstructed. So we have a different form of slavery. And I've talked again that we can't, af we can't avoid slavery. So people are going to reconstruct slavery however they want. You can't get away from slavery. You can't get away from restitution when people cause pain and, and are required to give restitution. The issue is what kind of slavery does a person and does a nation uh, practice is it biblical slavery where slaves have rights where they where they're not like in America uh, told they can't have a firearm they can't vote uh, most of them can't get work after they're slaves uh, they're constantly marked by the scarlet letter of slavery and they walk around in our modern so advanced and so prim or so amazing culture yet we have scarlet letters walking all over the place and they are monetized. You are worth more in the prison, monetarily, than outside. Remember that. The most Americans are worth more in a prison to the prison industrial complex, to the jailer, to the, to the, to the police officer, to the judge, to the lawyers, to the wardens, to the people who even cook the food, the, ca the cafeteria ladies in the prisons. All of that is monetized so that we can that the government can create jobs. Do you see it? Do you see it? And there's great hope in Christ. Great hope in Christ. There is no hope anywhere else. But you are hopeless if you don't even do anything. And your only answer to anything is not what the liberal says, not Hillary. That's what my answer is. My answer is not, uh, is a pure reaction of no answer. That's my answer. You need to be reading every day. Every day. I want you to Google autodidacticism. Autodidacticism. It sounds like a big word, but all it is is basically the belief that you are responsible for learning and educating yourself and applying what you've learned every single minute of your life. That learning doesn't take place here on a podcast. That learning doesn't take place in a classroom. It doesn't take place in a specific area or environment. That learning is what you are created to do, and it is, it is induced by God's creation upon you as you walk around and either give dominion, or bring destruction. You're either giving the, you're either bringing dominion to the earth, or you're bringing destruction to the earth. And if you're bringing destruction to the earth, it has a built-in covenantal framework, like a computer program. If you will not obey the Lord, you will be thrown out of the land, vomited forth, hated by your own children. The family will deconstruct. The liberals will, will deconstruct everything else and try to create a new Western worldview. Or your faithfulness will lead to God's abundant blessing and fruition and love and peace among all the people in that nation. You choose this day who you will serve. I want to show you how I... I want to end this, but I want to show you how I keep myself informed. You need a modern newspaper. That's what all people need in, in, in this modern world now is a, is a new form of newspaper, a new form of keeping yourself informed about both local politics and federal politics, about culture, psychology, you name it. Now, you can't be informed about everything, but you can have friends who are practicing what you're practicing. Travars Tut brought this up, that surrounding ourselves with people who are going somewhere, people who have a purpose in life, people who have said, I am striving for biblically deconstructing and biblically reconstructing the world around me for the glory of God and for dominion of Christ's kingdom, for the obedience of the nations. So what you can basically do is get on Google and you can type in on your, like uh, go to your setup and you can look at 
when I open up my browser, it will bring up automatic websites. And here are the websites that every time I click on my browser, I'm going to read two or three articles today from one of these websites. Uh, Reason.com is one of them. Mises.org. AmericanVision.org. Cato.org. Ron Paul's Liberty Report. Excellent, excellent on deconstructing. Real for the most, he's not perfect. Ron's not perfect, but it this he he is great at deconstructing. And what we need to do is we need to surround ourselves with sources that are faithful, um, as as faithful as possible to the idea of deconstruction, so that we don't have to. I don't have to reinvent the wheel with every single issue. Because we are building upon this foundation, I don't want to rebuild the will every generation. That's not the point. That would be fall. That would be fallacious work. It would just be. It would. Not, we would never go anywhere. Instead, our children and their children and so on and so forth should be constantly growing in our nation and deconstructing where it needs to be. You need to also find some kind of community newspaper. Now, I'm not talking about your your big, huge newspaper. I'm talking about like some of these newspapers you're going to get where they're covering the bond in your county, where they're covering uh, uh, you know some of the, you know the the things they're discussing in your city council meetings. You need to be getting on social media and create and creating a news feed around yourself. And going into groups and forums that are local county poli- pol- political issues. You don't even have to say anything in those things. You could just watch people. Hey, look at what this guy's doing with the with the bond. Or hey, look at you know they're not letting these people build over here next to the dump because uh, how smelly it is. You know you uh, you can stay informed about all this stuff, and you you're commanded to. Or else you you're just gonna have your head in the sand. So we basically want to be able to control as much of our media as humanly possible. You can't do that when you entertain yourself with the news. There is a difference between being informed with the news and being entertained by it. If you turn on the television to get your your news, you are merely being entertained long enough between news stories so that the networks can make money off of you during commercials. That's it. They need you to stay until the next commercial break so that they can make money on advertising. Now, I'm not saying uh, you shouldn't have any advertising ever. I'm just letting you know that when you build an entire structure about monetizing news around advertising, um, all you're basically going to do is have a bunch of talking heads who want to keep you either in complete fear so that you're constantly beholden to them to give you the answer or to uh, tell you, you know, what to think. And uh, you've got big issues there. So you need to find a way to control your media. You have to make it a lifestyle decision to refuse to turn on the television and create an entire feed of reliable and liberty-based news that you can rely on locally, nationally, and internationally. I hope that helps. Um, I, I hope I've blessed you guys today. If you have any questions, email me or private message me on Facebook. If there are anything, any critiques you have for me, let me know, please. I hope this blesses you. May the Lord keep you. May He bless, may he bless you. May His face shine upon you. Soli Dea Gloria. God bless. Thank you for listening to Man at the Gate. Go forward, Christian, and apply your ethics to all areas of life. Begin to discern the world around you. God bless. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts, where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now 
to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.